In Genesis 39, I'll read two verses. I'll read verse number 2 and verse number 3, and then we'll pray. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. I'll ask you if you wouldn't invite you to pray for me and let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for the privilege to be able today to handle and have a copy of your word. I'm reminded of the people all over this world that would yearn to have a copy of the Word of God. And today I have multiple copies of your Word and I cherish them and I thank you for them. Throughout the night, last night after leaving here, throughout the day, this today, God, you have thought and brought and, and, and revived and stirred this thought in my mind. But God, there's no way possible that I can deliver it without your help. God, I yearn for one thing, and that is the people in this building to get the help, God, that they need, that you be seen, that be, you be glorified, and they be brought closer to you because that is what we met here for. We met here, God, Lord, to be better and grow better and grow closer to you so that when we leave to go out of this building, we go out there in the world, we can share your goodness. So God, please help us, I beg you. I beg you, God, please help us today. Please put your touch and your power upon me. Guard my lips. Don't let me say anything that don't need to be said. Keep me centered on the Scripture because the power is in the Scripture, not in my thoughts. God, I beg and plead that you would just have your way here tonight. Now, Lord, if there is one that not, does not know you in the free pardon of sin, God, let tonight be the night. God, that they just come to trust you as Lord and Savior. Lord, if there's someone here tonight that's about ready to throw in the towel, they know their outward appearance looks great, but their inward soul is hurting so bad. They're ready to give it up. God, give them that that they need tonight. God, that they won't quit. That they won't stop. That one that's lost their zeal and lost their fire. God, please, please let them find something. Lord, you hover about them and let them get that what they need tonight. God, I pray, I beg and I plead. It's got to be you that does it, so I beg you to do it. In the precious and wonderful and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. I want to bring a thought. God being my helper tonight, on don't overlook the Lord at work. Do you know many times in our lives when we come to the place that we feel like we cannot see God, we think God's not working? We always are a visible people. We talk about living by faith. But if we don't see it, we don't believe He's doing anything. It always has to be a visible thing in our lives. We always have to know that and feel like God's there. And so many times I've heard preachers say this, and I ain't going to tell you whether I agree with it or not, but they say when you can't, tr can't track God, trust Him. But there's times in our lives it seems like it's hard to trust God when we cannot see God. And in the midst of when we're not seeing Him, we think God's not doing something in our lives. But I want to tell you something. I believe God's always working. Young lady in our church that's been visiting a little bit, her grandson, her son, her, the grandparents are bringing the little boy, his little bitty boy, uh, Tiny, and they told him I won't call no names because some of the family may be watching, but we've been praying for that girl that God would save her. I was in the prayer room the other night, the morning, and I was praying, and men were gathered around praying, and I was praying, God, will you please deal with her heart? God, please deal with her heart one more time. God, please show up in her life. At about that time, the Holy Ghost of God smote my heart. He said, don't worry, I'm doing my job. She's just got to come to the place that she's going to do hers, amen. I do believe God is at work in everything in life, amen. I don't believe God lets up. I don't believe we have to beg God to do. I don't believe we need to yearn for God to do. We just need to be obedient and allow God to do. There's the problem. We got to see it. If God ain't in, the, if we ain't shouting, then we think God ain't in it. So many times people come to the house of God, and if it's quiet, there ain't no shouting. Everybody acts like they're mad at their neighbor. Right. Well, boy, that God didn't show up. Let me tell you something. God's here. Yeah. You say, how do I know? How do you know I brought him? Amen. Yeah. Did you? 
If you're a child of God, everywhere you go, he's there. Amen. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But because guess what? If that outward appearance don't happen, if that show don't happen, if somebody, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm a pastor. If my people don't go to the altar, I get nervous. When they're not in the altar, I'll start preaching on the altar. Amen. And the use of the altar. Trying my best to get them to realize what, how important the altar is. But the fact of the matter is, if I'm truthful with you, I think when I don't see something, then God must not be working. And I'm here to tell you, God's always working. Amen. God is always in the midst working. I want to preach just a little while on that subject. Don't overlook the Lord at work because so many times we will overlook it and we will not thank God is nowhere to be found, that he's not doing anything, that nothing good is coming out of this. The only good things in our lives are God, is God. Amen. I need you to know something about Joseph, and I've done a try. I love to study on that, yeah, that individual and in the Word of God. You'll find that in his life that he went through a lot of great, a lot of great things, a lot of uh, tragical things that so many times that you may not have been able to look and see God in if that was you. But I need you to know something. Sin did not cause this. What he had to deal with and where he had to go and what he had to face was not because of his sinful lifestyle. He had sold out to the Lord and lived for God and done his best. He wasn't perfect. Like you and I, I'm filled with that the house of God is filled full of people tonight that you know what? Your desire is that God get glory out of your life. Amen. That everything you do glorify God, you'll do your best. And listen, I'm, I'm amongst a bunch of people and I know if God dealt with your heart and there's something going on in your life that God wasn't in, you'd give it up. Amen. You'd get rid of it. But you know what? We're not perfect. And because of that, sometimes we think because the problems and the places that we are, well, God's not in it. We must have erred to get here. We must have messed up. We must have sinned. We must have fell short. When in deep inside of our heart, we're doing everything we can for God. Amen. 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 Yearning, reading his Bible, praying, talking to him, spending time with him. Every time the house of God's open, you're here. Every time revival takes place, you're here. Every time choir practice comes, you're here. If you, don't, if you don't make it right on time, you'll be coming in anyway, but they know you're coming. Amen? They know you read your Bible. They know you're witnessing. They know you're knocking out, they're going out and knocking on doors. They know that you're out about and telling everybody you can about the Lord Jesus Christ, but still there's times in your life when you cannot see God. The Bible said in those verses that I read that the Lord was with Joseph. Bible said that the Lord, he was a prosperous man. And by the way, when he says a prosperous man, he ain't talking about materialism. He's talking about something money cannot buy. Amen. Amen. The in a place of his life, that peace that passes all understanding. First church I pastored, some of you probably remember, was in Holton, Maine, on the Canadian border, right there on the line. I remember going to going to one day the first surgery I was there first church ever passed didn't know I still don't know much about it after twenty something years still learning but anyhow I remember the first Miss Myrtle first surgery first person that had surgery in the church she had cancer and had to have some cancer spots a tumor removed and she just went into the hospital to have surgery and I went there that morning of course it was right in town I wasn't three minutes from the house there I went right over there to where she was and I went in I said alright Miss Myrtle are you doing alright yeah I'm good preacher I'm great she said hold on just a minute now they're fixing to run me out of here but before they do I want you to meet the doctor I said, all right, Miss Burton. Now, this was a woman that had been a Catholic for about, she was about 72 to 73 years there, and she had been a Catholic, raised Catholic for 70 of them. She had just been a child of God for two years. I walked in the hospital, sitting there with her, just talking, and she, she doc, come in. She said, Doc, let me introduce you to our new preacher to church. I want you to introduce you to him. Now she said, now, he said, now, Miss Myrtle, listen, what you're doing is serious. We got we to carry on. No, doctors, hush about that. I'm going to go home in just a little while. 
He said, Miss Merle, you don't understand. You're having a very extensive surgery. You're not going home. You won't be able to go home by the time you be three or four days before you go home. She said, let me tell you something, Doc. She said, my husband's at work right now. He can't take off of work. Now listen, at that time when I lived there in 1999, the average annual income for Aroostook County, which is the largest county in Maine, was $12,500. These people didn't know, I mean, they didn't know what things was and they didn't know what money was. They, they lived off the land and lived off what God gave them. But she said, she said, my husband will be at the house here and I won't get to cook him dinner. He said, 12, she said, at 12 o'clock every day I cook him a meal, but I ain't going to get to cook him a meal at 12, but I will cook him one at 6 before he goes to bed. I said, what the name of God this woman doing? She told the doctor that, and she said, Now, Doc, you can talk about your surgery to somebody else. I don't want to hear nothing about it. I want you to meet my preacher. You know what I done? I listened to her. I shook my little pointed head every time she went eating her head, shook my head shook. I said yes, and she said, Let's pray. I prayed. We left. She went and he grabbed her. They took her on. She had done hindered the I mean, they'd supposed to have done been out of the room 15 minutes ago. But she don't want to talk about the church and about God. She grabbed a hold of that stretcher. Doc, the doctor, now how do you ever see that? But the doctor had a hold of the stretcher pushing her out of there. He said, we're going to surgery. Well, I waited there till she got in. I went, stayed around there a little while. She come out in recovery. A couple hours went by. She come out of recovery. I went, left and went home. I said, I'm going to go back down there and check on her for a little while. About 6 or 7 o'clock after supper, I'll go check on her. It wasn't that big a deal. I went back down there about 6 or 7 o'clock, and I went in there, and I said, listen, I'm looking. I went to the, I went to the room where she was supposed to be, and there wasn't a soul there. Scared the snot out of me. I thought she was dead as a hammer. I said, oh, dear God, what in the world's happened? I ain't done, maybe I, I don't know. I said, I said, where is Miss Myrtle at? She said, you must be that preacher that was in here this morning. I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, she's at the house. I said, what do you mean she's at the house? I said, she, she said she went home. Well, I went to the house. I had a cell phone at that time, but it wasn't one of them that you wanted to talk on very much because they charge you out the nose to be able to talk on it. So I went to the house and picked up the phone. I called Miss Myrtle. I said, Miss Myrtle, I, I dialed that number, and all of a sudden, here she was on the other line. I said, Miss Myrtle, what are you doing? She said, I'm cleaning up the dishes. I said, what do you mean cleaning up the dishes? She said, I come home and cook my husband's supper, and we done eat it. And she said, now guess what we're doing? We're cleaning up the house, fixing to go to bed. I said, what are you doing? She said, God took care of me, and I could. It was a piece about her that just could not mean nothing else. Amen. Now I want to tell you something. That's something that money cannot buy. And that's something that you know what Joseph had. He had a piece that he knew God. And he did his best. Hey, he wasn't perfect. But he did his best to please God. But the Bible said he was a prosperous man. Bible said in verse number 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him. Bible said in verse number 3 also that the Lord made all that he did to prosper. I need you to look in just a little while and we're going to overlook uh, the life of Joseph and see how that, you know, if you ain't careful, you won't see God. You ever been there? Now God, where are you at in this? I know you hear God, I got you in my heart. But this situation I'm dealing with, I don't feel you nowhere. And the fact of the matter is, God, I don't see you working because the prayer, the prayer, and the way I'm praying it, you ain't answering. And ain't I glad he didn't? Because yeah. yeah. I'm going to tell you, there's been times in my life I've prayed things that would have totally changed a whole lot of people's life if God had answered my prayer. Right. Amen? Yeah. Probably mine too. But I'm thankful to God that he did not answer yeah. that prayer. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 37, Talking about look, looking here and remembering what Joseph was. Joseph had a task at hand. Now I need you to understand something. When God let Joseph be born, God let Joseph have one job to do and that one job had to come to fruition in his life and he had to go through some major things in his life to ever get to where God wanted him to be to do the job that God wanted him to do. In Genesis chapter 37... You'll find in verses 6, he talks about a dream that he had. Verse number 7, he talked about being there in the field and the sheaves by, his sheaves being there and his, son, his brothers, all their sheaves bowing down. 
Verse number 8, he talks, they talked about how they, how do you think you're going to rule and reign over our lives? Go on down there just a little bit farther. Verse number 9, you see he had another dream. Verse number 10, his daddy rebuked him and he said, do you think me and your mom and your son, or your brothers are going to bow down to you? Joseph didn't totally understand what God was doing. God had one job that he wanted him to do. Not two, not three, not four, but he had one big job that he wanted him to do. And I firmly believe to every child of God, God has one thing that he wants you to do. Sometimes in life, you may have to go through some, th through some things to be able to get there. Joseph's life and his whole journey, his, his whole job was to save his people. To come to the place that God could use him to transform a people. I say amen right there. Because you know what our job is? Our job is one thing, and there's only one thing we're left here to do, and that is to save the people. Amen. I ain't got no saving power, but I can tell you about somebody that does. Hello? And the fact of the matter is, how often are we doing that? That is the one job that God has left us here to do. And that is we might see somebody come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And you pray, now you pray, our men are out knocking on doors right now. I keep looking at the watch and I'm not looking at it about preaching. I'm looking at it wondering where they're at right now. They've been out knocking on doors for about an hour and 15 minutes trying to, get, trying to, trying to uh, see if somebody come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Three or four weeks ago three or four weeks ago one of our men knocked on the door a lady come to the door and she was a Muslim she was very nice to them talked to them very plain very simple as was shared her belief and everything left. Next week we were knocking on doors as we knocked on another one. I didn't. My choir leader, Big Doug, some of you won't never maybe get to meet him one of these days. They had planned on sneaking up here but something happened that they didn't get to the latter of the week. Big uh, he's out knocking on doors and when he knocked on doors he knocked on the door and there's a little old Muslim boy about this big come to the door they started telling him about Jesus a little bit about Jesus they had a great conversation in the midst of that conversation he invited him to the house of God Sunday morning comes we're here and the choir's getting ready I'm up here talking to brother Doug trying to make sure all the service is prepared trying to get everything in line and he's saying and I'm looking at him like this that's the way he always does he looks at the choir and then he turns around and looks at me now, standing here looking at him trying to talk Sunday school's over we got a little bit of break there in between preaching time I'm sitting here talking and his eyes is wandering back through there I said pay I thought to myself now you pay attention to me quit paying attention to them people back there and all of a sudden he looked and he said that's him preacher that's him I said what you talking about that's him he said that's that Muslim boy he come to the house of God and he sat over there in the pew and he sat right behind him listen we went to eat meal with him we, that, after, after we preached and after the service you could see him sitting there just looking. So inquisitive about what we learned. He said, after the meal, after the service was over with, Brother Doug said, hey, we're taking him to dinner. You want to go? I said, sure, I'd love to. For the next hour, we sat at the table at the Mexican restaurant and talked about my Jesus. <laughs> You know what? He never got mad. He never got upset. He never got bothered. He never said anything. He just sat there and listened about. He had asked, tell me something about their religion, and then I'd tell him something about. And you know, they believe Jesus as a prophet. I didn't know this about them. You know what they believe? They believe while he was headed to the cross, as he was headed to the cross, Gabriel the angel come down, and he didn't make it to the cross. They took him on to heaven right there. I asked him, I said, don't that make that prophet special than any of the other prophets you ever had? I said, because the fact of the matter is this. He didn't come after none of the rest of them prophets, but he sure did come after that one. Don't, you don't that tell you that Jesus is something special? He said, well, I guess it does, but not special like you think. I said, give it time, it'll come. Give it time, it'll come, amen. You can't hang around God and start talking about Jesus and you be around people that talk about Jesus and you know what, their lives will be changed. Now ask us this question. Is there any other job in our life that's more important than taking the gospel to the lost? Nothing should be. Who do you know today that's lost and needs Jesus? Who do you know that it's your job to do that? Who do you know that's your place? Sometimes in Joseph's life, if you're not careful, you'll miss God. You won't see what's going on. 
I want to show you some things, God being my helper. Number one, I want to look at the placement of Joseph. How many of you believe God can place us where he wants us? Sometimes in our lives, in the midst of God placing us, we have to look back and see what God was doing. And every time I've looked back, I always see opportunities that I've missed. But right slap dab in the middle when I see where God has placed me. And I recognize God placed me here. God can do a tremendous work. First place I want to look at the placement of Joseph in Genesis chapter 37. You, you can go there if you want to. But in Genesis chapter 37 in verse number 23, the Bible says, And it came to pass when Joseph was come to his brother that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was, of, that was on him. They placed him, they took him, and they cast him in a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and they looked and behold a company of Ishmaelites came bearing spices and bombs and myrrh carrying, going to carry it down to Egypt and Judah said unto his brethren what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon let, let our, our, let not let our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content and when they passed by the Midianites merchants and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver they brought Joseph to Egypt the first place I see God placed him was a pit now I ask you a question what did Joseph do to deserve being in a pit besides doing what his father told him to do all he was doing was the duty that was laid before him. Have you ever been there? Say amen. There's a duty laid before you. And in the midst of that duty, you're doing your duty as great as you can. You're trying your best to point people to God. You're trying your best to love people. You're trying your best to have the right kind of Christian atmosphere about everything going on. And I'm going to tell you something. Now you listen to me and listen to me well. You want to get in an in-depth study, you need to go over there in the book of Matthew when he says judge not and do a little bit of studying on that and figure out what God's really talking about because you're going to find out God ain't talking about what you think He is. Ain't nothing wrong with judging according to the Word of God. I don't want my grand boy being with the wrong crowd, and I'm going to judge him. Let me tell you something. What a beautiful sight. See all of you dressed up. I wondered what in the name of God was going on tonight. I seen all, all the boys. Now, here's the thing. Girls, I feel sorry for you. You always come dressed up. They come this way one time, that away one time, but you always got to dress up. I said to myself, this must be something going on tonight because all of them's dressed up with ties and bow ties and everything else on. Got up and sung, you look wonderful. Thank you for doing that. What a beautiful sight it is. But I'm going to hear you, you listen to me and you listen to me well. The Bible does say to judge. The Bible does say to discern. There are some people you don't have no business being around. And the only way you're going to know who to be around who not to be is to be a judge. Right. Yeah. That judge not basically is talking about being critical. Yeah. Right. Now let me help you here just a second. As you stand up and look at, you're the piano player. I'm gonna pick on you because you're gonna get it. You just well get used to it. You're gonna get picked on for a while. Yes, sir. You're a big old boy to be 14 years old. If you put a little meat, if you put a little meat on your bones, you'd be something. You see them boys right there? Hey, some of them got some junk going on. You ain't got no business being around. No, I didn't say maybe so. It's my story. You let me tell it. Yes, sir. They got something going on. That one right there, you can see it in his eyes. You can see it in his eyes. Look at that smirk. He's hiding something. He's hiding something. You can tell that. It's one thing to discern he's doing something and stay away from him. 
But it's another thing to discern something and then talk about him. Because when you talk about him, you're judging. You're being critical. And when you're being critical, you can't really be that spiritual Christian you're supposed to be. So the key to judging and discerning is this. Uh-oh, he's doing something I ain't supposed to be doing. I just ain't going to be involved in it. If it takes me not being around him, I just won't be around him. But guess what? I ain't going to talk about him, and I ain't going to stop loving him, and I ain't going to stop caring for him because I'm still going to do that because guess what that helps you? That helps you to be a right child of God. But when you start looking down on him and you start judging him and you start talking about him and you start running him down and you start I, I just, just being uh, deceitful about him, guess what you've done? You judge, and that's what Jesus said not to do. Right. We're so spiritual. We're so spiritual. We want to point out everybody else's flaws. Can I ask you what did Joseph do when he was placed in the pit? You sorry bunch of brothers of mine. You bunch of scumbags. If I could get up out of here, I'd whoop the hide off you. What'd he say? What'd he say? Not one thing. Because you'll find in chapter 39, God still blessed him and God was still with him. Amen? Yeah. We want to act so spiritual that we can condemn others and God still be with us. But the fact of the matter, condemning others is judging. And guess what that does to the Holy Ghost in your heart? It grieves you. I'm as fundamental and independent as they could be. But I'm going to tell you something. That's a bunch of preachers trying to tire the other preacher down to make their self look better. I ain't got no use for them. Because the fact of the matter is this, all that what they're doing is being a judgeable, judgeable person. And when they're judging, listen to me and listen to me well, do you know what they're doing? They're dampering what God has in their lives. Now you say, preacher, what are you saying? I need you to understand. There's a placement in the pit. Now, now ask you something. What was going on in that pit? His brothers had forsaken him. Right. Have you ever been to a place in your life where people forsake you? Are you, are, you, are you looking at that as a woe is me or as God are you still here? Because a lot of times when we feel like we're not popular or we feel like we're not, you know, nobody don't want nothing to do with us. Nobody don't want to be around us. We wonder what's going wrong in our lives because something's wrong. Yeah, about two and a half years ago, I told Brother Doug about it last night. I went to preach for a preacher and I won't call his name, but I went to preach for a preacher on Sunday night. I don't never leave the church on Sunday. I'm always there on Sunday unless I'm on vacation. I, tell you, I save my times away from the church to be on vacation. But anyway, I don't, I, Sunday night I took a chance to be away from my church and went to preach for him. And I preached what I thought was exactly what God wanted. It was one year before he ever spoke to me again. I asked my, I asked my wife, I said, what in God's name did I say? What did I preach? Did it not make no sense? Was it awful? Was it terrible? Did I make somebody mad and didn't know it? I done figured in my mind God must not have been there because I was being you know what I was being forsaken. Until one day I realized, you know what? I done just exactly what I knew God wanted me to do. And you know what? Maybe it wasn't the greatest and maybe the house didn't get saved and maybe there wasn't nobody moving and maybe there was moving. I do not know. But here is the thing. No matter what's going on in our lives, when we're in a pit, we must keep our heart to where God can use us. Now listen to me. You've got to understand the main goal for him to get was to get to Egypt and to save his people of through, that, through that great famine that they had and God had to get him to Egypt and this is part of the plan to get him to Egypt. This is placement number one in where he had to be. He was a pla- it, was a pla- it was a place that they had left him to die. Now you say, preacher, they, 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 wasn't, they wasn't going to let him die. They said they wasn't going to kill him. You know what the Bible says about that pit? What does the Bible say about that pit? No water. Do you know what you do without water? Eventually, die. What is it they say about your loved ones when they get really feeble? Say so they ain't drunk or eat nothing in days, preacher. They're about ready to cross over. They wanted Joseph dead. They just didn't want the blood on, blood on their hands. And you know what? They wanted it to be slow and painful. 
You ever been now where the world wants you to be that way? Have you ever been to a place in your life you're doing everything you can and the next thing you know you're placed in a pit feel like you're dying feel like it's a slow death and all of a sudden you wonder where God is in the midst of any of this thing but the fact of the matter is you got to realize and see that as a child of God guess what are you doing your best let me ask you a question can anybody in the house tell me are you doing your best I asked this question and if they if this don't go are you as right with God right now as you've ever been in your life now there's some of you in here can say yeah I am I am literally in the presence of some people that you know what there's nothing between you and your God because if they were you'd have done been in this altar and have got it right you know what it is to be close to God and you know what it is to be in love with God and you know what it is to love him to the greatest of your abilities and do everything he tells you to do but in the midst of that hey sometimes you're in a pit and you feel like you died don't give up hope cause God's still there amen and God's the very one that allowed that pit experience to come for Joseph Joseph done nothing to deserve that pit but God knew he had to go to the pit to get the where God could use him he would have never made it to his purpose if there had not been a pit oh my I sit and think about the churches that I pastored I tell the church the first church that I pastored I'm sorry I was not the greatest pastor that ever was I tell the second church that I pastored I'm sorry I was not the greatest pastor that ever. matter of fact I still ain't on the third one but let me tell you a little, a little story about Preacher Preacher Lockie. Preacher Lockie went everywhere I went preaching. He flew to Maine. Got up there, preached his heart out. That's where I went to Bible College in West Lenore, James Lockie. I said, Preacher, what do you think? He said, Stace, it's good. It's different. He said, still just something ain't clicking, but give it time. Keep preaching. Surely it'll click. I said, all right. A year and a half goes by. I missed the old-fashioned shout, stepped out of the will of God and left. Now, I missed the will of God. I got away. I just walked out. Not mad, not upset, talked myself into going south because where south is where Jesus had to be. Talked myself into it. Went to the second church, went to an associate pastor for a little while. That didn't work out. God wouldn't let me stay, didn't let me stay there long. Seen a lot of people saved, a lot of things going on, a lot of teenagers saved. A lot of things tra- transpired there, but that wasn't where I was supposed to be because of God's will. Went to the next church and pastored it. Done my dead level best. Preacher Lockie come and he preached two or three times there. He preached two or three times. I was there for nine years. He preached two or three times there. And after the, the last time he was there, I'll never forget it. Him and Brother Burns, Brother Jim Burns was with him. We sat down in the pews of that church, and I said, Preacher, what you think? He said, I'm going to tell you exactly what I told you the last time I talked to you this. Just keep on preaching. Surely it'll click after a while. He said, Brother Stacy, I can't put my finger on it, but he said, something just ain't exactly what it needs to be. Now, I build, we built a ministry. We, we built it and everything down there and had a great place, a wonderful facility, great house. Just wasn't exactly. There was always something missing feeling. I resigned the church. I was installing windows and I moved. I was installing windows for seats. I had to move close to the office. I tried my best to figure out how to buy a house and couldn't figure out one. God, God opened up one door and that was in Tacoa, Georgia. I did not know and all I've done is prayed to God. God, my children have not, we have never owned a house that they've been born that they've been raised in God give me a place I can own I've lived in parsonage and rental property all my ministry I said give me a place give me a place my babies can call home we bought a house within a month two months of the house we had a man over there laying concrete putting concrete down Just told him my story he told me he was looking they were looking for a preacher at that very moment our hearts clicked I knew I was supposed to be the pastor before I ever visited the church. God done told me that. You say, God don't work that way. He may not for you, but he sure did for me. I set my own the first Wednesday night before we ever went. I set my wife down. On a, I sat down on an ottoman, and I put my son and my daughter and my wife here, and I said, you know what? We've been here two months, and I didn't know why God put us here, but I do now. I shared with them. That was in December. Things rolled on until about February. February the 14th, they voted me in as their pastor. As I voted, as I went to the pastor of that church, a couple of months went by and I called Preacher Lockie. 
I said, Preacher Lockie, will you come preach for me? He said, listen, Miss Lockie, she has to travel with me all the time now. He said, can you take care of her? And I said, sure can. Bring her down. First night, he was there on a Monday night, got in the motel room, and he started preaching. After he got to the boat, he preached. I got him out, took him back home. Next day, he wanted to ride around, see town. We rode around the next day. It was about dinner time or something like that. We was going to go get something to eat. And I said, Preacher Lockie, I said, what do you think? He said, can I tell you, ask you a question, Brother Stacy? I said, what's that? He said, did you marry the first girl you went out on a date with? I said, thank God, no. <laughs> he said, did you date around a little while till you found what worked? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, that's exactly the way pastoring works. You better marry that crowd and stay with it. I would have not been the pastor that I should have been if I hadn't went through one and two. You say, preacher, what are you saying? There was something missing that God had to instill inside of me. It wasn't the people. Bless the people of the first church I pastored. They're great people. You know what's wrong with them? They're pastor. Second church I pastored. You know what's wrong with them? Nothing. Good people. They're pastor. That was the problem. Because in the middle of those pits, I didn't see God. When the pit would come by, I would look, I would think something was wrong. Let me tell you something. When you're in the pit, God's there. If you don't do nothing, listen, if you've done something to deserve the pit, well, just bless God, ask God to forgive you and get out of it. But if you're here tonight and you ain't done nothing but live for God and love God, but you're still in the pit, I need you to understand, God's still there. Amen. And in the middle of that pit, you can be the person God wants you to be and still get to the place and still serve the purpose in the middle of that pit. You say, preacher, what are you saying? There's a place, but that placement was the first place he was placed with a pit. The second place, and by the way, Genesis 15, and I ain't got time to read it all, but Genesis 15, verse 13, shares with you the purpose of God. God told Abram, guess what? You're going to go, your, our people, my people, the people you don't even have yet, are going to go to a land, a, a foreign land, and they're going to spend 400 years there. God knew, I don't know for 100% why they ended out there because of the sin and the things they did. But here's the key. I can't pinpoint what caused them to be there. But God knew they was going to be there. And God knew He wanted them still to be blessed when they were there. God had a plan in the midst of their mistakes. And that plan had to be revealed to a man named Joseph. God is going to make this come to pass no matter what it takes. God's people due, due to issues in their lives are going to have to go through terrible places and terrible bondage. Listen. That pit was a place of bondage. He couldn't get out. You can't tell me if he could have got out of there, he wouldn't have been out of there. Have you ever been in a place you just couldn't get out of? You couldn't get out of till God said it's time to get out of it. Oh my, people don't know what developing film is anymore. But when people film, film had to be developed, there used to have to be a dark room. And it had to stay in that dark room for a while to ever get a pretty picture. <laughs> Listen to me. Hey, sometimes in our lives, God will let us get in the pit. But I beg you and I plead with you, keep your heart where God can use you in the midst of that. Because if you do, God will get glory. If you're in a pit tonight, look around and see God. Because guess what? God ain't left you. How are you saved? He's still there. When you ask Him to save you, He's coming to your life and He ain't going nowhere. And let me tell you, according to the Bible that I have and the Bible that I read, you can't get rid of Him. Right. Amen. Amen. Bless God. I, many years ago when I was in Bible college, my wife, she wanted a cat. We hadn't been married long. She wanted a cat. Wanted a kitten. I got her a kitten. Little thing hung around outside, but it liked coming in. And I drove 76 miles one way to Bible college every morning and every evening. I got up and got ready, going out the door, and when I went out the door, that little cat come in. And I was always running close on time. I grabbed that little cat, and I'm going to say, now, you got to stay out, cat. My wife is in the back doing laundry, doing something, I don't know what. I had that little cat, and that cat was legs hanging there and legs hanging there. That's how big it was. I took my foot, and I kicked that door open. 
I said, you know what? I'm going to teach this cat a lesson. Hey, I'm going I'm to teach that cat. Don't you come in the door again. What possessed me to think you could whip a cat on the rump? I ain't got a clue. I popped that cat once. And about the time I popped that cat once, I popped it again. And guess what? I couldn't turn that stinking thing loose. I was throwing, I was stomping, I was beating it on the door and that thing was biting me and I clawed on me. It was giving me a fit. Took me forever. Matter of fact, I drove 76 miles, wiped blood off my hands the whole way down there, got in the tr- got in the, in the red little bathroom there washing my hands. Scott Moneyham walked in and said, looks like somebody's been rabbit hunting. I said, I ain't been rabbit hunting, I've been fighting with a cat. He said, I'd kill that cat. Let me tell you something about the Lord. If you ever got him, you can't get rid of him. You don't want to, but if you lose your mind and you want to, you still can't get rid of him. Amen? Hey, and that's what you need to recognize. I'm in a pit. I'm in a place. God put me here. I've done nothing to deserve being here. I didn't earn this pit, but I'm here. I'm in bondage. I didn't do nothing to do it. I I had a place where I'm dying, but you know what? Sooner or later, God's going to rescue me out of this place. Now you say, preacher, what he's saying in the first place was a pit. If you go through the word of God a little farther, you'll see in Genesis chapter 39, verse number 1, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought him on the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. First place he was placed was in a pit. Second place he was placed was in Potiphar's house. Now he gets into now he's come out of that pit. Thank God for the rescue of the pit. Woo, now I'm going into chief high. You study Potiphar. He is the top bodyguard of Pharaoh. He is the main man of Pharaoh's bodyguards. He lives in a fine place. He's got fine food. He don't have no nothing. I mean, everything he's got is nice. Now Joseph done come out of there, and now he's into the, now he's into a palace, almost a palace, a second palace, I guess you could say, a fine place to live in. Everything's a going great. Fact of the matter is, he spends thirteen years in that house. Now, after thirteen years, sometimes you know what you think. I got it settled. I done got her nailed down. I'm going to be there a while. Things is going good. Things is going great. Everything's well. And then all of a sudden, something goes south. You ever been there? Hey, some of you in here that had marriages go that way. You didn't do nothing. All you done is love God, live for God. Hey, some of you in here got young'uns. You know what you done? You raised your young'un in the house of God. You told him about God. You didn't, you didn't drive it down their throat. You didn't beat it down their throat. You loved them to Jesus. You, may, I have a problem with all, a lot of this stuff. Now, you just can't. Preacher, you can't make them do stuff. You'll take them and give them a bath kicking and screaming. Hold them little suckers down. Grab them by the head. Get that toothbrush. And brush them teeth in them fighting like a, a wild animal. But you can't make them do anything. You just got to let them do it so they can learn. Every one of you got somebody in your life makes you take a bath. Because they, some of you ain't old enough to want to do that yet. You get by two or three days without one, you'd be all right. I don't want that matter to me. Now wait, when you start looking across over through yonder and you start getting little funny looking eyeballs at them girls sitting over on the other side, you'll take three a day. <laughs> Under God, you'll be scared to death. Say, yeah, yeah, it's coming. Just give it a little time. Just, just enjoy this while it's not there though. <laughs> just enjoy this while it's not there because once you get bit by that low down thing, it's all over with. Life as you know it is going to change. I didn't say how, which way it was going, bad or worse. It can go either way. It's whatever, God, whatever you let God do for you. Right, right. You get the wrong one and you're in the mess and it ain't her fault, it's yours. You're the one supposed to find God's will. Yeah, right. Now I know she is too, 
But if you're ever going to be a man, you're ever going to grow up and be a man, you better figure out how to find God's will. Yeah. Everything going great. I'm in Potiphar's house. God's a blessing. Oh, what a thrill. Everything I touch is just getting blessed. And then one day, somebody with that wrong eyeball done started looking my way. Day after day, she started tugging. Day after day, she started trying to brush across him if she could. Day after day, she put a little extra smelly stuff on. Day after day, she changed a little bit of outfit, a little bit different every day. Now listen, we're talking about Egyptians. We ain't talking about God-fearing people here. So you know where I'm going without saying it. Day after day, he kept letting God honor his life, and he kept staying I don't care what she does. I don't care what he does. I ain't going to pick on the boys all the time. Girls, you listen to me. Tell Brother Doug, if that, boy, if that boy fools with you in the wrong way, you just tell Brother Doug. You're sitting off close there, fella. Songbook in between you. What's the name of God's wrong with you? I'm still fundamental, independent, believing, but put a songbook there. Hey, man. Don't worry about telling you, Daddy. Just tell the preacher. He'll slap a snot out of him. We look for a reason to do it. Amen. But you say, preacher, what are you saying? All's are going well in Potiphar's house. Now Joseph probably may think, you know what? Found my place. This is where I'm going to serve and this is what I'm going to do. I don't know how. It's going to come to fruition, but this is the beginning until that day. Everything he knew come unglued the house that he was living in the bed that he was laying in the food that he got to eat the people that he was in charge of the things that was going on that God that he could visibly see God blessing because the Bible said even the fields prospered because of him he didn't go out in the field. He just stayed at the house. But because of him, the fields were even blessed of Potiphar's. Could see it all in his eyes. By the way, guess what? Even though he could see it, he still kept his heart where it needed to be that God could honor it. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, even though he's seen the fields were white under harvest and there was a lot growing and there was a lot going in the house, he didn't let pride get in his way. He didn't realize that he didn't think he was the man. You say, preacher, now how do you know he didn't think he was the man? Because God was honoring him. Because God was blessing him. Placed him in Potiphar's house and it all come unglued. Have you ever been there? When it comes unglued and everything starts falling to shambles, you know, as they say around my house, when one thing comes, they all come. Snowball effect. Once it starts, it just keeps getting bigger and there's more keep coming on. You got your place, or you got your heart where God can honor you? See, to ever get to the palace... He had to go through a pit of bondage, death, dying, forsaken, to the palace where everything was going great. There at Potiphar's house, I should say, not the palace. Potiphar's house. And then watch it unravel. And when it unraveled, he still kept the right spirit. When it comes unraveled around your house, can you keep the right spirit? Huh? Boy, Sunday morning's an unraveling time sometimes, ain't it? Sunday morning's a good time to have a his and hers bathroom. Sunday morning sometimes ain't a bad time to ride two different cars. Sunday morning ain't never the time to say, are you ready yet? Some of you men slower than the women. Boy, it's real quiet. If I'd have said that about the women, every one of you men would have said Amen. And some of you women, some of you men got more particular about your hair than your wife does. Everything got to be just right. And all of a sudden it comes unglued. Walk in the house of God. Come in the driveway. 
Youngins are screaming and crawling out the windows. Sit down, shut up before I whoop your snot out of you. Get out of the car. I'll fly away, oh glory. I. Woo, it's good to be in the house of God. Your youngins looking at you thinking you're full of it. <laughs> Amen. Get up there in the choir. After you get up there in the choir, tears just a flowing. Just think, everybody thinks you're spiritual and you're just mad at your husband and your wife. You're just mad you're crying. God ain't nowhere amidst none of it, but you're just so mad and tore up you're crying. And then we wonder why God ain't a blessing what we're a doing, why, why God puts us in those places. I need you to understand, God allows us to go in those places sometimes to better us as a child of God. You say, preacher, what do you say? Hey, that's time. You got to realize he done nothing to deserve what he got in Potiphar's house. He done nothing to deserve the blessings. And he done nothing to deserve the ridicule and the punishment and the taking away. He was still the man God wanted him to be. God placed him the placement. This was God placing him in the pit. God placing him in Potiphar's house. Now God's placing Joseph in prison. He done not one thing. He ran from that woman. He honored his master. He honored his God. He loved his God. He loved his master. And he even loved his master's wife in the right way because he wasn't about to destroy her life. And he walked back and he fleed, but he still ended up in prison. Listen to me. What did you do to get to where you are? You didn't think it could get no worse and all of a sudden it got bad. Then it got better. Then all of a sudden it come unglued. And boy, now when it comes unglued, it's everything you can do to keep a straight face. You walk in the house of God and you're hiding every bit of it. You're hiding it all. And you know what you got? The whole problem is the only reason you got to hide it is because you can't see God. You don't realize that you don't did that. What did you do? Be honest with me. If you really knew what put you there, how crazy would you be not to confess it before God to get out of there? Yeah, right. Amen. Amen. Right. Ain't a person in this building if done something to deserve to be in that spiritual prison right. that you would not have confessed it so you could get out of it. Amen. I know God's people enough to know, yeah. but He done nothing to be there. Right. He done not one thing to go down there and be in that place of prison. But guess what? He still lived in a way that he saw God and God honored him because guess what happened now? Now he's done got in prison and God started blessing prison. God started blessing everything he touched there. You know why? Because guess what? He could not change the place. He could only change the way he responded about the place. Here's what I need you to understand. You may not be able to change the place you're in, but you can change the way you respond to the place you're in. Do you trust God? Do you love God? Are you living for God? Guess what? God's right there with you. And you say, preacher, what are you saying? You gotta realize God has a placement. Those poor people in that first and second church that I pastored, God placed me there to teach me some things. Because I promise you, when I went to the church where I am now, if I'd have bypassed one, I'd have made a mess. If I'd have bypassed two, I'd have made a mess. But I went right through the order God let me be because you know what I done? All I was wanting to do was be where God wanted me to be. I know you enough to know. There's the right kind of spirit in here enough to know. All you want to be is where God wants you. All you want to do is what God wants you to do. But guess what? It ain't always the right place in your life. It don't feel right like it's right. It don't have to see. You don't have to see. God to know he's there. What does the word of God say? Whosoever shall what? Call upon the name of the Lord. What? Shall. Have you ever done that? Did you do that? Do you know it? Do you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're saved and you're in heaven? Get God. Then it don't matter what place that ever comes in your life. God will always be there. God will always be there because he's with you. Now you say, preacher, what are you saying? I need you to know there's a place. There's a placement. There's a pit. There's a Potiphar's house. There's a prison. 
And then there's a palace. You know what Joseph done again to end up in the palace? Same thing he done to end up in the pit. Just what he was told to do. Are you doing what God tells you to do? Listen to me. Are you obedient? Do you love God? Do you live for God? Are you living for Are you doing exactly? Is God walking up and down your soul wanting you to do something for Him? Are you, is, God, is there a loved one or a friend, a co-worker that God's wanting you to talk about Jesus to? My little daughter, as I said last night, last year and a half has been a difficult time for her. In the midst of all that she's went through with, her, I think, just lost it there. I think part timers, mentor in school. When she, this is her first year of teaching. She teaches pre K. Her, she has a mentor that she had to follow throughout the year to learn their methods of doing it. Now, the way our school system works. The school that she's in, there's seven pre-K classes and 14 kindergarten classes. And that's all the school consists of. You go to the next school to get first and second grade, the next school to get third and fourth, and then you go to the middle school to get fifth and the rest of the middle school. Her mentor that she was around is now faithful to the house of God, is now saved is now very active in everything she can do, is now bringing her son, now bringing friends. Kaylee said to me, she said, Daddy, did you see that girl sitting about the fourth pew back in the middle? I said, I did. She said, that's a janitor over at the school. I said, sweetheart, how'd you get her here? I said, I, she said, I don't know. Now, one of her best friends that she works with at this time, I, I say best friends, it's hard to be a best friend when you just know him for, you know, been around him for a little while, but a, a good friend, I should say. She said to her, she said, Kaylee, can I tell you something? Thank you. She said, what are you thanking me for? She said, you live a life through the middle of all this mess you're going through with that makes me see that yet God can. I don't know about you, but you don't. You, that, it ain't your daughter that said that. It's mine. Yeah. Bless God, I'm about to run back to Dakota just to kiss her. Yeah. You know why? She didn't try. She didn't make. All she done is stayed where God got her. Yeah. She got her heart to where that no matter what went on, she would let God get glory. No matter what's going on in your life, is God getting glory? No matter what place. I'm looking at people that ain't in the place they'd like to be. There's some placements in your life. It may be a health placement. You've done nothing. You have always taken care of yourself. But your health is hindering you now. Maybe your children is hindering you now. Maybe your job is hindering you now. Maybe the people that you're having to be around. Maybe your neighbors is hindering you now. Maybe they moved somebody into your area you had to everything settled in your home and you thought it's the greatest thing it ever was and your little daughter brought home a boy. Huh? He ate what you had picked. Maybe your little boy brought home a girl. She ain't exactly what mama wants. Mama wants something a little better than that. But you didn't do nothing. You've honored God. You've loved God. And now you're wondering where God is in the middle of this place. You better open your eyes and realize God's with you because you are a child of God. I don't have to have a feeling. I don't have to have an emotion. I got something far greater than that and I got His Word. Amen? Because I remember the day that I called on Him. But now I need you to understand. Joseph fulfilled his commission because of the palace. But if he hadn't went to the pit, he wouldn't have made it to the palace. 
if he hadn't went to Potiphar's house and everything come unglued, he wouldn't have made it to the palace. And if he hadn't went to prison, guess what? He wouldn't have made it to the palace. Because every single place you find in his life, something tied to the other one. The pit was the Ishmaelites that came by and bought him. The Ishmaelites was at Egypt and Potiphar that Potiphar bought him. Potiphar's wife made such a mess what he thought was a mess but he still kept his heart right that he ended it up in prison that had a butler yeah. and the cook yeah. and the chef that had a dream that he interpreted that one of them later told Pharaoh that caused him to be in the palace every single place in his life was connected the one thing that got him through it was keeping his life where God could honor him now I ask you this question have you looked over seeing God he's still there it may not be an outward appearance it may just be an inward heart but he's still there He's still the God that He's always been inside your soul. Maybe He ain't manifested in chili bumps, tears through your eyes. Maybe He ain't manifested Himself that way, but He's still there. Heads bowed and eyes closed. What kind of place are you in? It ain't really that you can do anything about the place, and if you can do something about the place, what are you waiting on? Do it. But if you can't do nothing about the place, you can only do, a, do with what you got to deal with about it. While we stand to our feet, dear God, I'm thankful for the privilege and the honor that we have to be in your house. I'm thankful, God, to know that no matter where we go, as a child of God, you are with us. Now help us, dear God, to see you in every place that we're at. Help us to recognize you. Help us to look to the heavens and see you. Help us to look inside of our soul and still know you there. Help us to get into your word and see you there. Help us to get into our prior closet and visit with you. Help us, dear God, to see you working in the places we are. We'll carefully pray and thank you. Bless the people. Stir in their hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.